I'm Luke Timmerman, the founder and editor of Timmerman Report and a contributing biotech writer at Forbes. Uh, here at the Bio CEO and Investor Conference in New York with uh, John Marigonori. He's the CEO of Al Nylum Pharmaceuticals. It's a leading uh, company developing RNA interference drugs. Thanks for being here, John. It's great to be here, Luke. So, your company is kind of this classic biotech story. I think of you as having gone through that Gartner hype cycle with RNAi, the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment when we realized, gee, it's harder to make these things work than we realized, and then you kind of crawl up the slope of enlightenment. It, is that how you think of yourself? Have you been through that ringer? It, it well, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, look, we, we, you know, when we were born, the, 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 the concept of RNA interference was really just a concept. And, and it was, it was, there was good reason to be hopeful and to, and to believe in the promise of it, um, but it was really very early. Um, and it was raw science, but the potential was what people were quite excited about. Then you transition into a period between 2008 and 2011, where the company was viewed by most people, and the technology for that matter, was viewed by most people as being dead, but it just hadn't laid down yet, okay? And so that was a period of time in which clearly the outside world, looking at what was going on, really had questions about where it was gonna go. You know, interestingly, we never gave up hope internally. You know, we, ne we never ever gave up hope. And then, of course, over the last, you know, three, four years now, since about 2011, end of 2011, we've now been able to execute on, on really showing the realities of where RNAi can go and building a pretty exciting pipeline uh, with that and building a, a company that's growing and, and obviously uh, thriving at this point in time. So we have been through that you know, early days of, of, of ebullience and middle period of, of uh, Durman Strong and then coming out the other side. And you mentioned in a panel earlier that uh, that Roche deal from 2007 was really critical to getting a lot of money on board yeah. to help you get through those recession years. Yeah. And now you just did an offering to raise 450 million. I mean, money is coming out of the sky at you. I mean, how does it? Well, how I, does that change the way you go about your business? Yeah. Look, I mean, it it you know it takes a ton of capital to build one of these types of companies. I mean, we've we've you know between equity offerings that we've done over the years and then pharmaceutical alliances that we've done over the years, we've raised over $2.5 billion as a company. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, we've invested around $1 billion into, in the company, a little bit over a billion. So, you know, but it, it takes that much money to build a pipeline, to build the technology from scratch into something that's, that's going to be um, effective at the end of the day. You're right. I mean, Roche, when we did the Roche deal in 2007, um, the $331 million of, of upfront cash that we received in that deal um, as part of that transaction allowed us to weather the storm of the recession, which allowed us to continue to invest in the technology. And had we not done that deal at that time, you know, we probably, I think we probably would have still been successful, but we would have had to do more offerings, probably more dilutive offerings. Um, we would have um, probably had to be more focused in our overall activities. And so those early transactions that you know may not materialize into anything uh, for them at the end of the day were certainly very helpful for Al Nylum. Now during this great biotech bull market, uh, you know, lots of people are happy, stocks are up, uh, money is flowing into lots of companies. Is there anything that you worry about, like perhaps uh, we've seen before where maybe too much money coming in and chasing too few good ideas or good management teams? Yeah, no, you know, it's interesting, Luke. I, if you look at the industry's pipeline today and, and you know, consolidated as one broad pipeline, I have never, in my 30 years in this industry, I've never seen such an amazing pipeline of new therapies in, in, in clinical development today, let alone what's preclinical. And, and so I think the fundamentals have, fu have really changed in our industry. We're seeing, you know, approaches like PCSK9 antibodies, RNAi, you know, um, you know, checkpoint inhibitors in cancer, gene therapy, wow. It works. It works. <laughs> it works. And so I think the money that's coming into the sector is based fundamentally on the quality of the pipelines that are there and, and, the, and the, the potential impact that these medicines can make in people's lives. And so I, I, I see nothing but positive in the context of where the R&D productivity and pipelines and quality of medicines that are emerging. And I think that warrants investment. It warrants um, capital that can be put to work 
to get these medicines to patients. So if an investment bubble doesn't worry you, what does? Listen, I, I, think, I think what's important out there right now, the one thing that we as an industry have to get right is, is articulating the overall value proposition for what we, what we deliver with innovation. I, I think that that's probably the one uh, thing that I think we can get it right. I think, I think we as a society want new medicines. We want innovation that makes a difference. We want to also recognize that there have to be incentives for the innovator to, to go through that 10 plus year horizon and the ups and downs like we've been through to be able to get there at the end. So I think all of that is, is critical to get right. And so if, that's, if there's any concern in my mind it's for, from a broader macro standpoint, that's the one. Now one last question. Uh, a lot of people may not be aware that you have a side gig as a venture partner at Third Rock Ventures. Correct. So that gets you exposed to a lot of interesting new things coming up. What's one thing from the last, say, six months that really caught your eyes, an interesting technology or idea on the far horizon? Well, I mean, I think CRISPR-Cas9 and gene editing is going to be very exciting to watch. Um, you know, the types of technologies, uh, company Editas, um, uh, and there are others out there as well, Intalia from Atlas uh, being another one. But these companies are really pioneering an approach that could be very exciting to see. They, they remind me of Al Nylum 12 years ago, Luke, and, and, and so to some extent seeing those type of companies go through what they have to go through to figure out how to make this work. Um, but have potentially the type of impact that we believe RNAi can have. That's pretty exciting, and so we look. For, I look forward to seeing that uh, uh, those companies grow in the future. Maybe you can share some hard-earned wisdom with uh, those companies. Yeah, I, I think the, the the number one piece of wisdom is uh, stay committed, stay persistent, stay committed. It's uh, it's going to take a long time to to get there. And um, but if you believe in it, if the, if the science if the science is right, you'll be able to get there. And and the money will the money will come to you if the science is working. At the end of the day, so just make the science work. It's pretty simple, actually. <laughs> Easier said than done. <laughs> Thanks a lot, John, for being here. All right, Luke. Great to see you.